right, folks, uh, look, this is one of the first times we've done a Skype interview, and uh, I feel like an old man trying to uh, be cool with technology, so I really hope this works. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ghost Boy himself, the man with uh, the smooth Downton Abbey accent, tell me, seriously, tell me you watch Downton Abbey. Yes, Downton Abbey is one of our favorite shows. Last year, he actually visited Hightier Castle, where a lot of Downton Abbey is filmed. Okay, so I hate you now, because I'm really jealous. So that's kind of cool. And uh, it's so horrible for, I don't know, I don't know what it's like over there in the UK. Maybe it's worse, but for guys to admit <laughs> that we watch Downton Abbey, right? It's brutal. It's brutal. Um, so, look, my first question is, and I, I think it's the most important question of all, and I apologize, Martin, for getting so deep so quickly, but I really need to know this. Can you change the accent on your computer? This is the question I really want to know. Like, like, can you do a Rastafarian Jamaican man kind of thing? Or can you do like some redneck from Alabama deal? Because I really hope you're not stuck with this Richard Attenborough voice, you know, for the rest of your life or for however long it takes. Um, or did you choose the British voice because you live in London? It makes you, you know hot to the chicks, makes you sound smarter, right? Can you at least do your, your home Afrikaans Af uh, accent? Can you sound like, like the homeland at all? Unfortunately, there is not that much choice in voices and accents. There are American voices, Australian voices, even the Japanese voice. Oh. Sadly, no South African voices and no Afrikaans one either. For that matter, no Canadian English ones either. <laughs> what also kind of sucks is I can't convey emotion, so no matter how I feel, I always sound the same. <laughs> but yeah, there were times, especially with my previous voice, perfect Paul, that I would have fun with it and tweak it to sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Seriously? Listen to me now, hear me later. Nice. <laughs> I like the Japanese one. I think it's, that's, uh, that's weird. Totally weird. But fun, yeah. Um... Okay, so my second question is also, I think, very important. How did you land uh, Jonah as your wife? I mean, you really married up, and you got to know that, right? Seriously, and and do, like, what accent do you use to reel her in? Tell me, it was Arnold. Yes, I am a very lucky man. Jonah is a real catch and is the love of my life. She is not only smart, funny, and talented. She's drop-dead gorgeous. She says it was more my words that wooed her than my accent. But yeah, I did need to teach my computer how to pronounce her name correctly. Right, I mean, I even had to learn that because it looks like Joanna, but it's Jonah, right? Yeah, okay. So, New Year's Day 2008, about 10 p.m., you get introduced to your future wife through your sister on Skype, right? And uh, this is going to be the best joke of the entire interview. Was it love at first megabyte? Yeah, I said that. Yeah, I guess you could say that. On New Year's Day, my sister thought it would be fun to introduce her family to her friends in the UK. I was working on my computer at the time and I remember turning around and there she was. We got talking, everyone else drifted away and before we knew hours had flown by. We seem to instantly have a connection, and I think we both knew there was something special between us. Seriously, come on. It's like a Harlequin romance. It's amazing. Um, okay, so I've watched other interviews you've done, and people keep saying that you have uh, such a wonderful way with words, which obviously played a key role, right, in you sealing the deal with, jo with Jonah. But, dude, come on. It's really not that fair, right? I mean, the rest of us guys have no choice but to say, like, the first thing that comes into our stupid male brains, and you actually have a killer unfair advantage here. Not happy about this at all. You're like the smoothest dude in the world, being able to take the time to craft your sentences and your thoughts and your, you know, your heart and tenderness. You can just do this perfectly, and I hate you for it again. Come on. Yeah. I guess I do. Although, to be honest, I do still say dumb things sometimes. Seriously. All that time to craft stuff and you still screw up. Nice. Good. You're such a guy. Um, okay. 
this is this is the uh, this is the one I'm not sure whether you know I'm not sure how to how deep to get into this or not, but I'm sure people wonder, even though it's really none of our stinking business, if you're able to have sex, okay? And I had a guy on my show a number of years ago, and and I but I knew him as a buddy, so it was cool. I felt okay to ask him this question. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to ask you probably the most intrusive question is because, well, I think it's something that. A lot of people think about and they wonder, but they don't re- want to ask, right? But that plus, I also think you'd make just a ridiculous dad, like a fantastic father. I really think that your experiences have given you insight to so much stuff that the rest of us dads could only sort of dream of having. Um, and of course, the other great thing is that you would never be able to fly off the handle and say stupid stuff to your kids. Um, and then they spend years in therapy trying to get over the whole, you know. You get to be the smoothest, coolest dad in the world, you know, typing out your patient responses and totally unfair again. So, so are there children in the future? And if so, uh, where, <laughs> where do they come from? And I, hold on. I know where, I know where kids come from. It's not what I'm asking. Firstly, thank you so much for your kind words. Secondly, do. There is more than one reason for my broad smile. Yes, I am able to have sex. I am so grateful I can have sex because for so long I never thought I ever would. It's also like the best rehab ever. It's brilliant. And my wife and I have loads of fun together. I truly hope to one day become a father. And I can only hope to be half the father my own dad was. When we first got married, for various reasons, Jonah and I initially decided not to have children. But as time has gone on, that has changed and we are now trying and hoping we will have a family. We don't know if that will actually happen. But if we are blessed with a child, it would be wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, that's just, that's the understatement of the year. That'd be amazing, you know, absolutely amazing. Okay, well, thanks for uh, let me sweat through that because, you know, it's... It's the most awkward question. Hey, by the way, has any other interviewer asked you that question? Tell me someone else has had enough dopiness to ask that question. No. Ah, oh, crap. Okay. <laughs> Let's move along. Uh, so, Martin, the doctors pretty much gave you zero chance of, of uh, you know, reawakening and told your family that you probably wouldn't survive much longer anyway. Um, you talk in the book about how it got to the point where your mother uh, even said out loud you know, within earshot of you that she hoped you would just die and write the rest of us go, whoa. Uh, and I think some of us think that might be a horrible thing for a mom to say, but surely everyone, you know, given the circumstances, can show your mom enormous grace here. I mean, you know, there were times where you yourself wanted to die. And, and let's face it, right? If I was trapped like you were trapped, and, and just to give people an understanding of your state, you were aware of the inauguration of Nelson Mandela, the 9-11 attacks, the death of Princess Diana, but no one knew you were aware. Like, people got to get this, man. So I, I think m- most of us in the world would want to die as well. So, so please tell me your mom's been able to kind of forgive herself for saying that. Has she? Yes, my mother. I think my entire family was deeply affected by what happened to me. But my mother in particular really struggled to come to terms with it. For her, it was like her son died when he was 12. So while I was very sad and upset by what she said, I understood where that was coming from. It broke my heart in a way, but not so much because she had said, but because we were in a situation where she felt that everyone would be better off if I wasn't alive. And yes, at the time, I also often felt everyone would be better off if I were dead. In my book, I talk about the night I even tried to end my own life. It didn't work, obviously, and for that I am thankful. She has said she's sorry for what she said, never realizing I understood. Yes, she has been able to forgive herself. But honestly, it doesn't matter much anymore. My mom and I have a great relationship now. She is and has always been a good mother. That's cool. That's yeah, very very cool. Man, you're getting me all friggin' emotional here. Stop it. Killing me. Okay, so being being in this mental and emotional state of of wanting to die and being trapped for so long. 
how did you stay sane? Everybody wants to know that. Escaping my reality was really tough. If there happened to be a radio on that helped. I also developed coping strategies to help pass the time and basically to keep my mind busy. I began to take note of how things changed over time. Everything from how the seasons changed to things as simple as watching a wet floor dry, watching how the sun moved across the room and how the light changed. Another favorite of mine was if there happened to be an insect of some or other kind, and even better more than one, then I could pretend they were racing each other. But by far was to escape into my imagination. I would literally live in my imagination. I'd have conversations with myself and other people all in my head. I'd imagine I was doing all sorts of things. I would live inside my mind, sometimes to such an extent that I became almost oblivious to my surroundings. Man, okay. I'm still just kind of absorbing all that. Um, okay, you know, I often, I often wonder about astronauts and, uh, and how when they're all by themselves alone out in outer space... <clears throat> If they're somehow able to actually uh, tune in to another frequency and possibly sense God in a way that the rest of us and our busy, loud, agenda-driven lives are totally incapable of sensing, right? As a matter of fact, a few years ago, for the last week of Lent, uh, I gave up my eyesight, eyesight for an entire week, and um, and I just wanted to kind of kind of see if I could pick up on that on that uh, sensing God in the way that maybe I'd been missing, right? It totally didn't work, but it was. It was an amazing experiment nonetheless. But what about you? Um, so, Martin, if, if there is a God, did God come to you? Did God comfort you? Did God sustain you while you were trapped inside? Because you'd think that if he'd show up for anyone, dude, you know, it would have been you. And, and if you didn't feel the love of God at all, then you got to wonder if there really is a God. I don't know how I came to realize God. He was just always there. I don't know how to explain it really, but I always knew he was and still is there. I grew up in a Christian home, however we very rarely attended church. This combined with the path my life has taken meant that I never really learned the formalities of the church. Perhaps it is because of all I have been through, I became very close to God. There were many, many times where, in some sense, I felt utterly alone, even if there were people around me. However, I always seem to pause when making that statement because while a part of me experienced the extreme loneliness and isolation, another part of me always felt the presence of the Lord. I found myself talking to God. Perhaps one could call them prayers rather than conversations, even though my eyes may have been open and my hands were pressed together. Through everything I went through, I prayed for help, strength and forgiveness. I gave thanks for the blessings I had and especially for the prayers answered. Even if they were as small as someone moving my body into a different position that alleviated the pain. It is amazing what you can be grateful for. Simple things that a lot of people may not even think about like to sit or lay comfortably for a while. For me, God is always there, a constant companion. And yes, I believe had it not been through God's hand, I would not be where I am today. If I stop and think about everything that had to happen, and the odds of that happening, then there is no doubt in my mind that that could only have happened through divine intervention. Yeah. Man, you know, um, the way we have to do this interview is by, you know, i got to type up questions ahead of time, submit them to you, and you've got to have the time to type them up, and then you... You get this thing going, right? You hit the button, and boom, there's, there's your smooth answers. But I've got, uh, I've got so many back-and-forth follow-up questions for that one. And it, but it just, I mean, let me just leave it at this, man. Um, I, th I think it's important for the rest of us, and I hate to put you in that sort of weird category by yourself, but, you know, we haven't gone through anything near what you've gone through. It's really important for the rest of us to shut up to be quiet uh, and, and, and it is amazing how many people just can't be by themselves um, yeah and in the moment 
Yeah, 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 totally, totally. Oh, okay. Well, okay, so you began waking up around the age of 16, and everybody wants to know, like, what memories do you have of waking up, right? What did that feel like? What did that sound like? Do you remember any smells or new sensations or, or someone doing something? Do you remember what your internal commentary was like? My awareness was something that happened gradually. So it wasn't like one moment I was asleep and the next moment I was awake. It is quite difficult to describe, but I often say that it is sort of like looking at a grey completely out of focus image, and then gradually the colours start to flow back, and the image becomes clearer and clearer, until it is crystal clear and in vibrant colour. I was really confused at first and felt this weird disconnected sensation with my body. I remember hearing and seeing things, which I felt I should know what they are, but I didn't. For example, and I'm... Now oh, this is going to sound strange for the skirting board. I remember looking at it and feeling very puzzled by it. I didn't know what it was but felt I should know. It's not quite the same, but I think we have all had that experience when you know you know the answer to something, or the word is on the tip of your tongue but you just can't remember it in that moment. It was kind of like that, just to a much greater degree. As time went by, the world started to make more sense to me and I was aware of everything that was going on around me. Wow. Okay, folks, again, we are chatting with uh, Martin Pistorius and uh, the website you want to go to is ghostboybook.com. Ghostboybook.com. It's the name of the book and uh, and it's also his wrestling name for all the wrestling matches that he, he's doing. There. Do you have like a mask or a, an outfit or cape or something, Ghost Boy? Come on. You gotta have like something, some kind of cool ghost boy outfit. No? Yeah, the cape. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, okay, so around the age of 19, you pretty much came back to us. You still couldn't communicate. Do you remember the, the first time you tried to communicate with someone? And of course, they totally didn't get it. Like, that's the moment everyone keys in on, where you're trying to communicate. Because you can, finally. And they're not getting it. It took me a while to fully comprehend that I was trapped inside my body. So I'm not exactly sure when the first time was. But there were many times when I tried to reach out to communicate. And even times when I thought I was making movements, but then I began to realize that nobody seemed to be able to see or took any notice. That's why my book is called Ghost Boy. Because for so many years I was like a ghost, I could hear and see everything. But it was like I wasn't there, I was invisible, a ghost. Yeah. So, okay, how, how would you describe what it felt like when your therapist, Verna, you know, she, she first figured out that you could actually communicate with your eyes. Do you remember that very first time you made contact? And I'm really sorry to make you sound like E.T. Yes, Verna would talk to me as if I understood almost expecting a response. When she eventually picked up on the subtle signs that I was understanding what she was saying and began to see me, it was amazing. It was kind of unbelievable at first. Like, did she really get it or am I just imagining it? I remember how my heart was pounding in my chest. It was really exciting. It also gave me something else to focus on and think about. I think being seen and having another person validate your existence is incredibly important. In a sense, it makes you feel like you matter. Man. I have, okay, this, so this is killing me. I've got like a million follow-up questions. But I, I got to stay to the script, you know? So anyway, got to gotta do it. Um, okay. So, your childhood, I mean, how do you think not having a childhood has made an impact on you? Because, like, I know you had a childhood, but you don't remember anything before you got sick, right? So, now you're this grown married man with a career who never had a childhood. What, what impact does that have on you? Yes, that's right. I don't have any memories from my childhood. However... Through photos and stories I have been able to piece together and get a sense of what I was like as a child. Of course, writing my book also helped me sort through a lot of things in my past. It was very difficult and emotional at times, 
but very therapeutic too. I went through a period for a couple of years where I felt rather sad and had a real sense of loss because I felt in some ways I had missed out on so many things. It's been tough because there are things you learn growing up that I have basically had to try figure out as an adult. Joan says I am lucky because I got to skip all the traumatic high school years. I also probably got to learn other stuff which I may not have otherwise learned. Just this week I discovered a box with a toy of mine and it's really strange to see this relic almost like from another life. It's a bit like looking at someone else's stuff and thinking, hey they are like me, it's just the weirdest thing to get my head around. Confronting my past, the little boy I had been, everything my parents, my family, and I had been through was tough. But I also got to realize the love my parents had for me and how lucky I am to be where I am today. Okay, well, here's another thing that really kills me in all this, is that you were propped up in front of a TV and made to watch Barney for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and days and day after day. Barney, dude, Barney. So just that <clears throat> in and of itself should make every person listening want to go out and volunteer at these places, if not for any other reason than to just go in and change the freaking channel at these places. Ha ha ha. Yes. I often spent my days positioned in front of the TV watching Barney playing over mm -hmm. and over. To this day, I hate Barney. <laughs> I can't stand to listen to or watch Barney now. Not that I have anything against Barney, but it triggers memories and emotions which are really difficult for me. It's not just Barney, there are a number of other triggers. But I think in a way because Barney is so happy and jolly, I wasn't it made it worse. But yeah, at the same time, I can see the funny side to that now. One guy even said to me there needs to be a I hate Barney club. <laughs> yeah, there does. I'm sure it's out there already, but... Oh, man. You know, at the end of this interview, we're going to go out with the Barney theme song, okay? Just to tick you off. <laughs> I'm such a jerk. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you you have said that there, there wasn't a care home that you were in where there wasn't some degree of abuse. Dude, I mean, that is a heavy, heavy line. And, I mean, it either happened to you or, or you saw it happening to someone else. And I often wonder why we act the way we do, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when we think no one is watching. Like, what is wrong with us? You know, you see it on the internet all the time, especially in comment sections or forums. Within the first few comments, somebody feels empowered by the anonymity and begins to trash someone else in a way that they would, there's no way they would do that if they were face to face with the person, right? So seeing what you've seen, in a sense, <clears throat> you know, being the proverbial fly on the wall. Um, watching people do stuff they might never do if they knew you were really watching. What is your assessment of mankind? Because I've got a few words in my assessment, assessment of mankind, but I can't say them on the radio. So you go, Mr. Smooth. Yes, sadly, I was often mistreated in the care homes I was in. It was awful. Being abused changes something inside of you. Even though I have come to terms with everything that happened, to this day there are times when I still have nightmares and flashbacks. Through everything, I've learned that everyone has a story, their own struggles, challenges and insecurities. People, some more than others, put on a mask that they present to the world. However, directly or indirectly, what is going on behind that persona always seems to seep through. Through the way they react to things, the decisions that they make and what they say. Sometimes I thought, why can't you just be open and honest and your authentic self? But I would say that in general, people are by nature good, kind and care about others. Man, that's not what I was going to say at all. <laughs> you are smooth. Uh, the other day I just watched uh, Martin, the um, uh, movie, The Theory of Everything, about... Um, um, Oh, I just forgot his name. I was going to say Richard Dawkins. No, what's, uh, why can't I remember his name? Tell me you remember his name. Stephen. Yes, yeah, Stephen Hawking. That's right. Thanks. Um, have you seen it? And, and if so, 
would I be correct in assuming that this movie would have some sort of visceral impact on you, maybe more than others? Yes, I have seen the movie. Thought it was brilliantly done. Yes, it probably did have a greater impact on me, especially as in a way I can sort of relate to some of his challenges, and of course his computer voice. It also made me think about just how wonderful my wife is, but also worry a little about the things she has to cope with being married to me. But then we have spoken about it, and as Joan there often says that I am as much a support for her as she is for me. I must also say I appreciate Stephen Hawking's sense of humor. Totally. I, I, I don't know. I hope he's like that in real life. You know, movies, they try to do other things that aren't legit, right? But, man, he seemed pretty funny in that movie. Um, okay, Martin, obviously your, your story is now at the top of everyone's mind when it comes to the euthanasia and uh, physician-assisted suicide conversation. And that's a big deal over here in Canada because the Supreme Court just um, basically allowed it. They have a year to figure out how they're going to do it. But anyway, so I, I'm not even sure what the question really is to ask you about this. Um, all I know is that I was adopted and I'm quite thankful that no one tried to end my life. Uh, so maybe the question is, you know, what what would you like to say to those who are passionate about this intense societal discourse? These are complex issues, and I think that each situation is unique, each medical case different. I was not in a hospital being tested for brain activity by doctors or being kept alive by feeding tubes or ventilators. It is hard for me to enter such a loaded debate, and frankly, I don't know if I am wise enough to comment. But to quote Stephen Hawking's, where there is life, there is hope. Okay. I think it's always safe to get out of a, a hard question by quoting Stephen Hawking. So, again, very smooth. <laughs> um, okay, so over the last six years, I've become friends with, uh, with a previous guest on my show. Her name is Marcella. And uh, good chance you might be listening to this interview. And I've watched this vibrant, passionate Italian woman, now only in her mid-30s, slowly become trapped in her own body because of that freaking awful disease, multiple sclerosis. She still um, listens to my show. I th she might be forced to listen to my show from, from her, <clears throat> her hospital bed inside the living room of her family home. So her mom puts on the show and, and her mom listens. So, so they're listening. So what do you say to Marcella and her mom? and her family. My heart really goes out to Marcella and everyone like her who is dealing with a degenerative disease. It is incredibly hard, particularly when you are young and your whole life is ahead of you. I know that it's sometimes easier said than done, but all I can really say is to enjoy life as much as possible. You can learn to appreciate the small, simple, yet most important things in life. Being together with the people you love, the feel of warm sunshine on your skin, the taste of the food you love, the sound of music. Most people nowadays are caught up with always looking forward, never being in the moment, and I think that illness and adversity are hard experiences which can also teach you about the beauty of life, the beauty of the moment. Those of us who get to learn this are lucky in many ways. Well... <clears throat> Um, I guess we're, we're kind of at the end of this. And, um, so this is the part in the, in the script where I told you there wasn't going to be any scripted stuff. So here's the non-scripted stuff. Okay. <clears throat> First, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you really are ridiculously inspirational. And I know, especially as a, as a, um, a British male, you guys are horrible with compliments. Uh, but you could have easily just kept this story to yourself and to your family and just been that guy down the street in the wheelchair. Um, so thanks for not doing that because you really, you really are impacting a boatload of people here. And if there's a God and if this God is interacting with us and if this God uses us, um, Wow. He, he picked the right dude to to get the rest of us to listen to um, maybe just stop there like just to listen 
you know, you've said it a couple of times, be in the moment. Um, and I think being in the moment is a prerequisite for any kind of spiritual growth, you know, and especially as North Americans, you know, we friggin' talk our faces off over here and it's all about hype and rah, rah and, you know, um, yeah, I, um, I just am very, very thankful. Very thankful. And oh, actually, hold on. Now you were typing something. Do you want to? Thank you. I am really touched by your words. Again, smooth answer. I love that. <laughs> okay, one more thing, man. Uh, who do you see playing you in the Ghost Boy movie? And who's going to play your haughty wife? Well, that's something Joan and I have actually had a fun time talking about lately. Nice. And every time we see an actor on TV, we end up talking about who they could play. <laughs> At the moment, Joan says either Captain America, Chris Evans, or Bradley Cooper, <laughs> or Matt Damon. I would be okay with Matt Damon. As for Joan, it would of course have to be someone to match her beauty. Maybe someone like Charlie's Terran or Scarlett Johansson, or Cameron Diaz. Joan says Cameron Diaz because of her personality. That's funny. That's fantastic. I hope, honestly, I hope one of them hears this interview, hears the pitch that you just made, and contacts you. I mean, that would be just fantastic. Fantastic. All right, well, um, yeah, I, I've already gotten mushy on you and said thanks for sharing your guts, right? Um <laughs> And, and you really have, ah, man, I hate being this mushy, but you really have inspired me to actually grow up and be a better man. So thanks, mate. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been awesome. Um, all right, folks, again, just a reminder to go to ghostboybook.com, ghostboybook.com. Of course, that is the name of the book and the name of the superhero, my new superhero <laughs> I can't wait for the action. There you go. Action figure dolls, man. You got to get those. Yeah, I like it. Anyway, Martin Pistorius. I appreciate it, dude. Thanks.